All right, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about stock-based compensation. Uh, we're going to go through an example of stock, uh, stock options as a form of compensation in this lecture. Uh, we'll be covering restricted stock, uh, an example of restricted stock in a subsequent lecture. All right, so stock options and restricted stock uh, they are a form of deferred compensation. Uh, and the reason it's deferred is because the employee earns the benefit of the option as they work, so it would be now and over the vestment period, but they actually don't receive the benefit of the option until a future date, either when the option is exercised or the shares or options become vested. And so essentially they're working now for some benefit later. However, the company records the, records the compensation expense to match the benefit that the firm receives, and so as the employee works during the vestment period. So what are some benefits of stock-based compensation? Uh, it does save the firm cash because uh, this would replace other forms of compensation such as bonuses or, or just salary, and so um, it does save the firm cash. Uh, it does align shareholder and manager incentives because the shareholder um, the shareholders obviously are most concerned about their stock price and if a manager has stock-based compensation the manager would also be concerned about the stock price and so it does help align those incentives it also may aid in retention and the reason why is because if there's a vestment period especially if it's a cliff vesting arrangement where an employee uh, doesn't receive those options or st stock unless they stay throughout the entire vestment period the employees may stick around uh, at least until the end of the vestment period in order to have the benefit of the options or any other stock-based compensation they might have all right so now we're going to specifically talk about stock options. Uh, so a stock option is when employees receive the right to purchase shares at a future date at a predetermined price. Uh, it's usually the stock price on the date the option is granted, but it doesn't have to be. The right usually includes a vestment period after which the employee can exercise the option. Usually it's years. Uh, it could be uh, an, a range of years, three, five, ten, whatever it might be. Um, but uh, typically there's this blackout period where the employee can't exercise that option until after the vestment period ends. Uh, the value of the options is compensation expense and we allocate that expense over the vestment period. Uh, under the former intrinsic value method, the amount of the compensation expense was the difference between the market price and the exercise price at the time the option is granted. Of course, I just mentioned that many times the market price and the exercise price are equal, and so uh, under the intrinsic value method, if they were equal, there would be no compensation expense, and this became a problem, especially as stock option-based compensation became, uh, for some companies, the primary form of compensation. There are a couple situations where CEO might have an annual salary of one dollar but also but might receive you know one million options maybe that's an exaggeration but hundreds of thousands of options and so if the market price and ex exercise price was were equal it'd be as if that CEO were working for free but we know that's not the case and so under the current fair value method, the firm actually has to estimate the fair value of the options. Now the difference between the market price and exercise price is part of that fair value, but there are other things that are included like how long the option period lasts, how volatile the stock price is, uh, inflation, rate of return, all those kinds of things uh, like a Black-Scholes model would give you a fair value estimate. The firm can also make more complex assumptions like employee retention assumptions that can alter the timing of the compensation expense, but it will be very clear those assumptions ultimately would not determine the total. So the assumption can affect the timing, but the assumption cannot affect the total compensation expense. So as we walk through an example, um, Martin Corps employs 75 executives. Each one is granted 750 stock options on January 1, 2018. The options allow the executives to purchase the firm's stock at $30 per share from the end of the three-year vestment period through December 31, 2023. It's a cliff vesting arrangement. The fair value of the options is $8.50 per option. And I also provide a market price at the time the options are granted. You're going to find out that that's not really relevant to the problem, though. So first we see that uh, all 75 employees were still with the company as of December 31st, 2018. So everyone stuck around for one year. 
Uh, three employees leave the firm on July 10th, 2019. The remaining 72 employees are still there as of December 31st, 2019. Six more employees leave on August 1st, 2020. And those remaining 66 employees are with the firm through December 31st, 2020, which means that their options vest. And so how do we do the accounting? So the first step we have to look at for stock options, the first entry is the 2018 adjusting entry. Now, conceivably, the, the company uh, executives were earning their uh, compensation expense throughout the year, but there's really nothing to trigger an entry until we perform our adjusting entries at the end of the fiscal year. And so the total compensation expense, if you think about all 75 executives, every one of them having 750 options and the fair value of each option being $8.50, the total would be $478,125. But as I mentioned before, we allocate that compensation expense over the vestment period. In this case, the vestment period is three years. And so we would allocate one third of that total amount to 2018 for compensation expense in 2018 of $159,375. And so we record the journal entry on 12-31-2018, we have our compensation expense. And what we're sort of the other account in this case is this paid in capital stock options. And so if you think about the employee's work, um, really what's happening is the company is forfeiting um, uh, contributed capital to this employee in exchange for their work. And so, um, and so essentially, if you kind of think about that paid in capital account, we're creating contributed capital through the work of the employee. And so if you notice, the compensation expense is, of course, a temporary equity account. And then paid in capital stock options is a contributed capital account that eventually will get closed uh, when the employee exercises their options or if those options were to expire. Uh, but uh, there is no change in assets and there's no change in liabilities in this case because the compensation really is in the form of ownership. And so uh, then we have this July 10th, 2019, where the three employees depart the company. And so we have to think about, first of all, is, is there any previously recognized compensation expense? And in this case, there is. Uh, those three executives each had 750 options, and the fair value of each option was $8.50. And we had recognized one-third of that compensation expense for a total of $6,375. And so to, uh, when those employees depart, of course, we really don't have that compensation expense anymore. And so we essentially unwind the previous entry for those three executives. And so we now debit the paid-in capital account and we credit compensation expense. Of course, we do recognize that we recognize the compensation expense in 2018, but credit it in 2019. And so together 2018 and 2019 end up being zero, but we can see that the timing is a little bit off because we didn't know that these three executives were going to leave the company. All right, so then we do have the December 31st, 2019 adjusting entry. Again, we have to think about what is the total compensation expense for all remaining employees. And there are 72 of them that remain. It's still 750 options per executive and $8.50 per option. And so the total amount of compensation expense is now 459000 We recognize one third of that in 2019 for a total of $153,000 that we would record in 2019. And so that journal entry, of course, same idea, compensation expenses, the debit, paid in capital, stock options is the credit. One thing I do want to highlight, though, is that in 2019, the reported compensation expense would be the debit on our adjusting entry, but we would subtract off the credit from the three employees that left. And so the total amount that would be recorded or reported uh, on our 2019 financial statements would be $146,625.
Now we have uh, additional employees leaving on August 1st, 2020. Again, we have to think about was there any previously recognized compensation expense? In this case, of course, there was. Six executives each had 750 options. The fair value of each option is $8.50. And in this case, we had already recognized two-thirds. We had recognized 2018 and 2019. And so we need to unwind two-thirds of that compensation expense when those employees depart. So the journal entry, again, is the opposite of the adjusting entry. We're going to debit our paid-in capital account, and we're going to credit the compensation expense. And so on December 31st, 2020, we do have the adjusting entry, and it's the same process that we've been going through all along. First thing we have to think about is, what is the total compensation expense for the 66 remaining employees? That total amount is $420,750. And we would allocate one third of that to 2020 for a total of $140,250. The journal entry is a debit to compensation expense and a credit to paid in capital stock options. And similar to 2019, the reported compensation expense is the net of the two entries, the adjusting entry debit less the, uh, the departure entry of 25,500. So we would report $114,750 as compensation expense related to these stock options in 2020. So if we think about the three-year period, um, the first thing I always think about is what should we have reported over the three years? Well, at the end of the day, there were 66 executives that ended up being compensated with these stock options. Uh, there are 750 per employee or per executive, and the fair value of each is $8.50. And so the total that should have been recognized over the three-year period was $420,750. Uh, if we had done it perfectly, each year would have been allocated $140,250. And so that would have been the compensation expense each year. In reality, um, there were different amounts reported each year. In 2018, we had 159,375. In 2019, we had 146,625. And then 2020, we had 114,750. But if you add those up, and hopefully this makes sense, the total amount is $420,750. And so, again, the idea is we made no assumptions regarding retention, uh, and, and the lack of that assumption would never change the total amount of compensation expense that we would recognize. But because we assumed everyone would remain, that that basically, that that I'd say unrealistic assumption accelerated our expenses, and so we recognized more early in the life of the investment period and less later in the life as employees left. So following with the previous example, let's say that 43 executives exercise their options on January 1st, 2020. We're going to assume that the firm issues new shares to fulfill the stock options. So first of all, we're going to receive cash. Remember, with stock options, the employees have to still buy the shares. And so in this case, they have to pay $30 per option. Uh, so 43 times 750 times 30 means the firm will receive $967,500 cash. But if you recall, the market price of the shares was $35. So the employee is going to benefit, or whichever executives exercise these options, they are going to benefit of $5 per share. And so uh, that's the reason they would exercise the options. Uh, of course, we do also need to reduce the paid in capital stock option account uh, for the options that have been exercised. And so the 43 executives, each one exercises 750 options. And the fair value that we had assigned to that account was $8.50 per option. And so the amount of that debit would be $274,125. And so the journal entry, when those options are exercised, of course, we receive cash as a firm. We need to debit that paid in capital account because that account represents options that are outstanding. Of course, once they're exercised, those options are no, are no longer outstanding. In exchange, of course, we are going to issue new shares of common stock. The credit to the common stock account reflects the $1 par value, and any amount that we had debited above the par value goes into additional paid in capital. And so that's why we have the $1.2 million as a credit to our APIC account. 
And then finally, uh, we're going to make the assumption that uh, the remaining options expire on January 1st, 2024 after the exercise period ends. First thing we have to think about is what is the balance in the paid in capital stock option account? And so the original balance was $420,750. Uh, we subtract the amount from the options that have already been exercised, and so the balance was $146,625. And so to, uh, as a final entry to record the expired stock options, of course, that stock option at the paid in capital stock option account represents options that are outstanding. Once they expire, of course, they're no longer outstanding. So we reclassify that amount into an expired account. And that account is a permanent account that uh, essentially never goes away.